So we have here um, two errors, chase decode error and file not found error, and we want to do something with it. Um, just to customize how the grouping works. And in this case, we will not really necessarily want to reduce the noise, but we want to influence how it groups um, just as an, as an experiment. So what we can see here now is the default grouping happened, um, but we want to change the default grouping. And, and here are some, some ways in which you can do this. Um, and for this, we are going to go into our, our what's called custom fingerprinting configuration. So in this case, for instance, what we can do here is we can say um, in our fingerprint rules that if a certain condition is met, we want to override the grouping entirely, right? So we don't just want to influence the, the frames so that we exclude certain frames from grouping. We actually want to go in and tell it to completely change the, the grouping. So for instance, one of the things we can do here is we can just say, um, well, really anything that happens in this load JSON function here, um, we, we want this to group together. So we can, for instance, say stack.function, um, load JSON goes into one group that we call JSON error. Um, this will now cause that any future errors that are being sent in, I'm just going to quickly do this with um, one type of error here and then the other type of error here. Um, they will then, as they appear in the product, go into the same group. Um, so let's see if we see this appear here. Okay, let me time see if this applied. So, now we can see that um, this, what we did earlier, this database unavailable, this looked like this before, right? So you can see this entire stack trace here with all the frames equivalent. And now because our rule has in the meantime applied, future events really only show us our utility code, our web code, and everything from, from the framework is kind of hidden underneath. If you go to full, you will see this. And the effect of this is that when you look into your grouping information, there is now, uh, an in-app grouping applied, which really only takes a much smaller set um, of, of values into account for, for the grouping algorithm. Um, so let's see in the meantime, if I find my event on the overview page here. Um, right, so here I have this, this event. There's now a chase and decode error. And if we go to the older event, we can actually see that this was a the file not found error, right? So we have two events that are completely different in the same group now. And the reason this happens is because if you go all the way to the bottom, we can see that our load JSON fingerprint rule ma matched and routed us into this new fingerprint called JSON error. So any event now that has the same fingerprint will actually end up in this group. So I could make a completely different error and it will still end up in this group. Um, this basically allows me to force a lot of independent things into one group. So um, a very common example is, for instance, API calls. So if you, for instance, you, you use a um, library to call into an external service like um, Slack or, uh, or you just want to send a, a webhook and it could spiral into all kinds of errors, DNS resolution, IO, whatever, you could use this to say like, okay, anything really that happens in this sort of section of the code base I just want to force into one group. Even if they are of completely different type, I just want to accumulate them all. And then for instance, use Sentry's discover feature to dig into the details of that group rather than being in the errors product to, to just uh, uh, investigate this group. But when you do something like that, very often you discover that your group actually turns into a massive group that's going to give you a very little insight into what happens. And so maybe you actually want to go in and customize this group based on some conditions. So for instance, you could say like, well, I still want to have all of those errors, all of those JSON errors, for instance, uh, accumulated into one group, but I would then like to split this group by some other condition. So for instance, maybe I want to split this group by the server that the code is running on because that is, has some significance for me. Um, and so this is something we are going to do here. I basically configured the SDK to send um, two custom tags. One of them is called machine which is basically going to be my server host name. I'm just going to make this up here now. And then a second tag, which is called JSON file. It's just the file name. So if we look here, we can see that in this case, we tried to load this JSON file with this file name. And then we have this machine name here called machine-1. Um, we don't actually need to send the custom machine name because the SDK will also send the server name. But I just wanted to demonstrate this works with any tag that we're going to send. So what we're going to do now is we're basically going to go back into our issue grouping settings. Um, and I'm going to change this rule that whenever we, we match on this load JSON function, we don't just group it, uh, route it into the JSON error group, 
we actually want to um, also interpolate the value. In this case, we want to use the, um, I think we called it machine. Let's quickly check uh, this uh, machine tag in here. So if, oh, sorry, um, text.machine, right? So now it, it groups into um, JSON error plus this information. Um, we shall basically create me one group per machine, basically for all the JSON errors. The downside of this now is they're going to look very much the same, right? So how am I going to tell them apart? And so one way in which you can do this is you can basically also define a custom title. So in this case, we will say JSON error on text.machine, right? Um, so if we save this now, we, for future events, and I'm going to just send a bunch in. So this is the invalid file. This is uh, another one that's just a non-existing file. Um, we will then see on our, just need to find a better way to manage my tabs here. Um, as it's going to be processed, we'll see it appear. Uh, this is a couple of minutes ago. So here we can now see that there's JSON error on machine one. And if I go in, I basically have all these errors in that happened in this code base. And one thing also of note is that both stack trace rules and fingerprinting rules can apply at the same time. So for instance, um, if, um, I, if I were to have some custom code in a virtual env now in my stack trace, even though um, we didn't end up grouping by stack trace, this rule still applied and improved my stack trace, right? So I can have both at the same time. But the moment a custom fingerprint rule runs, it's going to win. Um, and we can, we can look at this because if we go down here into our custom fingerprint rule, we can see that, well, this low JSON rule matched with these conditions and this is what it did. And then you can see this by the values it generated. So it extracted JSON error, which is the first part of it. And then it also extracted machine one from, um, from, from the tags. And all of these were then folded into a, a custom grouping hash and then again, matched again into one group. And because we can customize the rendering of the title, you will also see that it dis displaces what's normally there, right? Under normal circumstances, you would see the exception type here. But in this case, we have the custom title here. So when you then are in the situation where you have a custom title that overrides the default one, you can still find the original information underneath on the error page. So you can actually tell what, uh, what those things are. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the main ideas of, of how you're going to customize the, the, the grouping from the server, right? Because when you do it from the server, you don't have to change your code to influence the grouping. So if you, for instance, see there's a lot of stuff going on in your project um, and you would really like to spend some time improving the grouping, you don't actually have to go into your code and customize this. We're going to look later how you can do it from the code so you don't have to configure it in a UI, but these are going to be complementary ways in which you can influence this. The, um, generally, my recommendation is to try to influence as much as possible from the configuration in the project when it's sort of uh, overarching in sort of different, different parts of the code base and you want to do this as part of your creation workflow, um, but to do it in the SDK side, if you're ready at the time where you emit a custom message, for instance, you're already aware um, that you want to force things to group in a certain way. But we're going to look at this later. Um, so since we basically have this now, we can also sort of merge them all together into one massive group if we want. So I'm going to just demonstrate that you can merge these issues and then they're going to end up to be in one group together and even the, uh, un, uh, even the code that wouldn't match would still feed into this for as long as it uh, produced a regular grouping hash. So um, now I want to go back to our web application and have it running a little bit and show you one of the quick wins you can get um, if you spend some time working on your grouping um, for, for sort of real world problems that you have. So this, this app that I showed you here, basically when you hit the slash users endpoint, every once in a while it produces an error because the database is down. And this is an unhandled error in the application. So we see it here, right? It's an unhandled error, database unavailable. And we can see here that it happened on the list users transaction, right? But this is not the only one. I could go to one of those users 
and now it, it happens here too, right? And so under default uh, grouping logic in Sentry, those are considered to be independent instances of an error, right? So I now have basically a database unavailable for show user and I have one for list user. Um, and so we covered earlier, I can group them together with custom fingerprints. And the reason this is really, really useful is because you have certain types of errors where you just know they are global, but Sentry itself cannot understand this. So for instance, if you have a very centralized service in your infrastructure, like a database, um, or you have um, Redis, a, a caching system, if you can identify where those types of errors are, you can really force them together to when you have a massive downtime, don't actually have a massive list of those errors appearing in your project because you will have them neatly contained within one group. So for as long as you can identify sort of these global errors in your code base, um, you're good. So I'll quickly look into how we can do this. Um, again, it's sort of the same as before, but instead of matching on the stack, we can now match on the error. So in this case, we know the error type here is always database unavailable. So if we take this, just copy this in, we can say like database is down or something. Now all the errors that have this type will be forced into a single group. Um, so I'm going to delete this now just to demonstrate what this looks like. And we're going to hit a bunch of errors here. And then we're going to hit a bunch of errors here as well. Um, then eventually we'll see once it starts processing in the pipeline, um, that there's one, one big uh, group now, um, which has all of the errors in. One of the ways in which Sentry works, it's um, as it's processing events in the system, it's going to take some time for these to show up, right? It's processed them instantly, but it, it might flush them out in, 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 um, with the delay of a couple of seconds in, in, a, in, in a massive, um, like batch of errors that are sort of similar in type. And because for instance, now we have both the show user error and the list user error in this database unavailable one, you can see that only the last one really shows up here, right? It shows show user, even though if you go into it, there will actually be list users too, right? In this case, an event came in afterwards that overrode it again. Uh, one way to find out what's actually contained within um, this, this type of um, group would be to go to the events view. Uh, sorry, the text view, where you can then see the different values that fed into it. So we can see that in this group that we forced together, um, three events were from show user and two events were from list user, right? So there, there are ways for, for, for you to, to see what of the content of this group is, um, even as you force it together. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the, the basics of what you can really do on the server. So next question is like, how can you discover what you can do with this? So we introduced the, the, the two big concept, fingerprinting rules and stack trace rules. Both of them are documented in the documentation. You can follow the link here. Um, and this here, for instance, is all the rules that you can do on stack traces. So for instance, um, if you are a C++ project, it's a very common, um, common thing that you have namespaces in front of your functions. You can, for instance, use this to automatically force all of the um, functions in STD colon colon and then like uh, anything afterwards to be definitely not part of your application. Likewise, if you do a lot of JavaScript, a very simple way for you to is force everything in node modules out of your application. That's normally already the case. The SDKs will attempt to configure this out of the box for you. Um, but there are cases where it can slip through, particularly if source maps are involved or you have more complex setups, or maybe it's not called node modules, maybe it's called something else like vendor. Um, in app, not in app is basically the, it, it removes it from grouping, but it also hides it in the UI. If you think it, you still want to see it by default, it's part of your application code, but you don't want it to be considered for grouping, you can also say like, oh, please don't group it, right? Um, in that case, it will basically say like, um, I'm going to ignore it for grouping, but I'm still going to show it to you by default. There are all kinds of matches available. You can really find a lot of this in the documentation. Um, but there are also some, some, some examples of what you can do with this that are more powerful, that really give you a very good experience um, if you have um, an application that behaves in a certain way. This is particularly useful for C++, for instance. If you, for instance, um, have a function 
that is sort of the basically the top of your stack trace all the time. It might be that you want you know that this is the top, and I don't want to see anything above, even if the frames are above are kind of random. So for instance, you can then say if if the function always has like begin panic at the top, I I want to never show this and I want to never group on it. Likewise, if the bottom of your function of your stack trace is always the same, like for instance, it's an event loop or it's um it's the fret start method. You can also say like anything underneath this um, should be uh, should be ignored. So um, I will just show you what this would look like. You could basically have a rule where you say like if my stack function is um, spawn fret, for instance, there might be something underneath that you don't want to see. You can say everything down from here is not application code, and this is also not application code, right? The, the V means downwards um, and the, the, the circumflex means uh, towards. So this goes towards the crash, this goes away from the crash. So there are many different ways in which you can experiment with this. Um, to see how these stack trace rules apply, you can, um, you can go on, on an event where this has uh, been done. So we should actually see it here and you can then go and show details. And when you see, in this case, um, we don't actually group by the application stack trace because the custom fingerprint overrode it, you can still look at what it did. And so for instance, you can see that this was um, marked out of app by stack trace rule, right? So you can see the rule that we have in our, in our uh, configuration uh, settings. And you can see it's like this applied, and it was marked out of app. And um, so you can sort of debug this experience here and, and, and get a better idea of how it works. Uh, overall, it's a very powerful system and it requires you to some time to experiment with it. But if you're from suffering under a lot of alert noise or something like this, it's, it's really worth diving into the possibilities that the system gives you. Um, so this is as far as you can go on the server side, right? There, there's, there's a lot of documentation available for you to, to explore all those different ways in which you can do it. 